continent to, to ensure that health services are available to even the poorest of the poor, and so that people are able to access health care no matter the community they live in. And of course, we, have, we need uh, good governance within the health sector to be able to effectively ensure that we have an effective and excellent health care. Of course, the tier laboratory network is very important when you have the, the primary level laboratory, the secondary and the tertiary to be able to have a good laboratory system within the continent. Of course, we need well-designated and safe laboratory facilities to be able to have an effective healthcare in the continent. Of course, the issue of supply chain management is, is key. In vitro diagnostic device regulation, so that you're, of course, geared towards having quality assured laboratory services. Of course, if you, have an, you need an effective equipment plan, which should uh, be an offshoot of a good strategic plan within the health system. Of course, you need to implement quality management system within your laboratory system. Now, core capacities and infrastructure required to support effective laboratory care is exactly what we have been discussing. Now, let's look at what are these challenges to effective laboratory barriers management in Africa. One is issue of coordination. Lack of coordination amongst national agencies, regional organizations, and development partners, leading to duplicative efforts, um, misalignment with government priorities. You know, if you don't have effective coordination of activities within each country, it is difficult to actually have an agency that is calling the shot in terms of leading the pack. So we need effective coordination of activities within each country so that when there is an outbreak, there is an agency that is taking responsibility and every other agency of government or even development partners rally around that agency and for effective response when there is an outbreak. Currently, we have dependency on donor funding. You will hardly find a budget head, a budget head within our national, uh, in, within our system for effectively tackling issues of biosafety and biosecurity. So most of the programs, most of the support within the continent as we speak is donor de dependent. So time has come for, for us to have a, a clear budget line for bar risk management within the continent. Lack of laboratory biosafety and biosecurity awareness. Yes, we have a, 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 a laboratory system, but a, a lot of uh, practitioners don't have the required capacity, don't have, they don't have the required awareness, the required training for effective bio-risk management within the continent. So there is still a gap in terms of training. Therefore, issues of certification, bio-risk management certification is key. So inadequate knowledge on laboratory biosafety and biosecurity leaves laboratories ill-equipped to handle outbreaks, risking personnel safety. Of course, lack of adequate implementation of laboratory biosafety and biosecurity policies, even when they exist, they are not well implemented in terms of managing bio risk or even putting mitigation measures in place. Of course, we cannot overemphasize the issue of capacity building and training. We need to invest in biosecurity training for staff and researchers, collaborate with international organizations and programs to offer certification courses. Of course, there are a lot of organizations offering certification courses in the continent. And of course, one of those organizations is African Society for Laboratory Medicine and of course, African CDC. WHO is also offering a lot of certification programs. So we need to take advantage of this capacity building efforts by these partners to enrich our capacity to be able to respond to emergencies. Community engagement is also key. Engage local communities in biosecurity efforts and raise awareness about the importance of biosecurity. Yes, a lot of persons must have heard of biosafety, but um, issues of biosecurity and the 
multi-sectoral nature of biosecurity, bio we need to have communities engaged to be, we need to carry communities along in terms of advocacy and in terms of <laughs> implementing, sorry, biosecurity programs. Of course, risk assessment is key. Develop user-friendly tools for assessing biosecurity risk. And we, we, we can do this by ensuring that our uh, issues of biosafety and biosecurity are actually incorporated as part of laboratory strengthening and ensure that we develop user-friendly tools for assessing biosecurity risk in our various laboratories. And since our laboratories are, are, are fragmented into the, the, the first year, which is the primary level, secondary level, and tertiary level. And as you move up the ladder, you, you, you will know you discover that the risk increases. So there is need for risk assessment of our of our laboratory system, be it at the primary level, secondary, or tertiary. What are those innov innovative uh, solutions to challenges of implementing biosecurity policies? Of course, one of them is infrastructure improvement. We need to enhance lab infrastructure to improve the five pillars of biosecurity, which is one, physical, material, information, personnel, and of course, transport. Collaboration and information sharing. We need to foster collaboration between government agencies and research institutions. Yes, no one agency can actually lead these efforts. So there is need for collaboration between government agencies, research institutions, and even the private sector to be able to tackle some of these challenges. We need to share best practices, research findings, and of course, threat assessment. Risk communication is key also. Develop clear and concise communication materials that explain bad security risks and preventive measures. There is need for us to communicate effectively within our health system so that everybody will be on the same page on issues of response to outbreaks. In conclusion, biological threats, regardless of origin, remain a major security concern. Overcoming these challenges requires adaptive and innovative approaches. Assessing these risks specific to the law is assessing it is specific. Assessing risks specific to the local context and prioritization of interventions based on the likelihood and impact of potential biosecurity threats. Therefore, collaborative efforts among stakeholders are crucial, as I said earlier, for strengthening laboratory bio risk management capacity in Africa. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the Federal Ministry of Health, WAHOO, African CDC, ASLM, US CDC, IHBN, Global Fund, WHO, of course, Merrick and Company for some of these materials. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, my, my very good brother, Dr. Philly, for that very interesting presentation. Your presentation was very detailed, starting from the importance of our security. Uh, you talked about the global air security agenda. It's so clear that you just came back from, from Australia, and I'm sure a lot of discussions on this were, was done in Australia. And you talked about the challenges to effective laboratory bio risk management, you know, challenges such, such as coordination challenges, dependency of on donor funding, which, which is very important for us in Africa to work on lack of laboratory biosafety and biosecurity awareness and lack of adequate implementation of biosecurity and biosafety policies. That is very important because I'm, I'm aware that a lot of countries in, in Africa have, have their own biosafety and biosecurity policy, including Nigeria, and even regions have started developing their own policy too. Like, you know, we just we just worked on one for, for a while but policy without adequate plan of domesticating and implementing it will not solve or address any problem. And some of the solutions you prefer to are very important, capacity building and training. You can't give what you don't have. Community engagement is very important for us to start letting people know about our security and the role of, of, 
of different stakeholders in ensuring biosecurity on the, on the continent, and infrastructural improvements, collaboration, and information sharing. Like you said, biosecurity issues are, are multidisciplinary, and for us to effectively address it, we cannot afford to continue to work in, in silo and effective risk communication. These are areas that you, you've talked uh, you've talked about a very important presentation from you there, Dr. Philip. Thank you very much. And without wasting our time, we'll go straight to our next presenter. Our next presenter is my brother, Dr. Jarez from, from African CDC. I will read his bow and then I'll hand over the floor to him. If I do that, uh, let me remind our participants again that. If you have any question, go straight to, our, to the question and answer section of, of, of the platform on the Zoom platform. And our speakers will be very happy to, to respond to your respond to your questions after their presentations. So the next speaker is Dr. Jarris Nomedian is a power safety and power security technical officer for African CDC. Dr. Jarez Anes his leadership skills to champion improvement to health and living condition, applying his reputation as a subject matter expert in biosafety, biosecurity, and infectious diseases, improves performance and outcomes by enforcing adherence to regulatory requirements while managing strategic improvement projects. Analyzing and addressing current gaps in policy, management systems, and biosafety programs in different medical laboratories in African countries. Currently works as biosafety and biosecurity technical officer at African CDC, where he supports African Union member states in strengthening biosafety, biosecurity system capacity and capability development, establishment of legislative framework, and compliance with national, regional, and international requirements. My very good friend, we speaking to us on strategic approach to strengthening power security frameworks in African nation. Dr. Jarez, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Babadoy, and good afternoon to everyone. So let me quickly try to share my screen. Uh, please, can you confirm if you are able to see the screen? And yes, you can see it clearly. Ah, thank you very much, Dr. Babadoy. So I would like to thank uh, the Gate Consulting for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, sessions. I want to thank also your yeah, other presenters and the participants online. So as you said, I'm uh, Dr. Joris Numedem Kenfak, working at Africa CDC as biosafety and biosecurity technical officer on the biosafety and biosecurity initiative since uh, almost two years. And I will be presenting today on the strategic uh, approaches to strengthen biosecurity framework in Africa nation. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Ophili also, who just presented and who really emphasized on some of the very important points, which will ease the comprehension of my presentation. So we, this presentation will just show the importance of fortifying the biosecurity in Africa to mitigate the biological threat. We also discuss a bit on the challenges enhancing and the strategy for biological threat reduction in our Africa regions. As I was saying, Dr. Ophili, he gave uh, some background in terms of uh, biosafety and biosecurity. Uh, and we can just say that biosafety actually focus on the public health and environment and from accidental exposures then related to safety, including all what we can use to protect ourselves, while biosecurity focus on the prevention and deliberate misuse of uh, the biological agents and then relates with lab security strengthening insider threat awareness. And then so talking on of biosecurity, we'll be talking on protecting pathogens from dangerous people who can use it for some 
can misuse actually. So biosecurity framework will then be very important as they will prevent the, if we use them properly, they will use, uh, they will be very helpful in preventing disease spread, protecting agriculture, preserving the environment, and also ensuring uh, economic stability and promoting global health security. So we have uh, actually many existing framework, including international conventions, like the Geneva Protocol, like the Biological Weapon Convention, the United Nations Security Resolution Council 1514, the Convention of the Biological Diversity or the Global Health and Security Action Group Global Partnership Program against spread of weapon of mass of destructions. We also have uh, other important elements as international declaration, recommendation guidelines, as the one of the UNESCO Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. Uh, we have many organizations also proposing uh, important frameworks uh, for biosecurity, including recommendation on the transport of dangerous goods model regulations, those proposed by WHO, OIE, uh, FAO, or even Interpol. So we also have uh, even in the in some region or even in some country the code of conduct or code of ethics of code or code of practice for those people working with biological agents. So these are actually non-legislated guidelines which one or more organization voluntarily agree to abide by and which set out the standards of conduct or behavior with respect to a particular activities. So we can have an uh, example in some of the country which are already domesticated or have in place the code of conduct of biosecurity like the one of uh, Netherlands. Uh, we will also see that uh, this, actually the topic is uh, very important. It's, uh, actually, it is the actuality and we can see that uh, in the recent year we have the global guidance framework for the responsible use of the life science which has been published two years ago by WHO and the Laboratory Biosecurity Guidance just published a few days ago. So all these uh, all these frameworks, they are now recommending uh, actually to work on a risk management decision. So to, pro to proceed by risk analysis after that, we should make an implementation plan in terms so we should make an implementation plan actually we make the risk analysis to make sure that when working with biological agents we actually we need to mitigate the risk or we need to make sure that the risk is uh, low enough to be acceptable meaning we need to check is it uh, biological agent is to be released do we is it well secure do people how to do, do not work with this pathogen? Can they assess our laboratory? Or what are the measures we should put in place to avoid them to assess our laboratory or to assess even the information that we have on the on the agent, like their pathogenicity, like their uh, ability to cause diseases, the fatality rate, and, and so on. So this uh, to propose that we have a risk analysis followed by implementation plan. But we have noticed that uh, even though we have a regional framework or international framework, in some of the country, we don't have national guidelines. And even when we have national guidelines, as Dr. Babadoy and Dr. Ophili just said, sometimes the coordination of the effort is very low, it's not really appropriate. So taking into consideration of all that, we see that globally we have these issues, but in Africa, it is uh, more emphasized because we see that the current biosecurity landscape in Africa actually faces more than other regions. It faces very complex challenges, including inadequate infrastructure and limited resources. And this factor will contribute to the vul vulnerability of the region to biological threat necessitating region interventions. We can also emphasize that Africa is, uh, has a very unique context as it experiences uh, the most health Agencies, but we still have one of the most limited capability for 
rapid detection of new threats, emphasizing actually the biosecurity challenges that we can face. And we can see on this, uh, oh, apologies, there is, uh, let me just come back. Okay, good. So we can see on this uh, slide, which showed the Global Health Security Index report, that we can have the five top countries in the world, including USA, Australia, fin Finland, Canada, and Thailand. In terms of uh, biosecurity, actually, I will focus on the biosecurity, even if, uh, so we can see that this country, they, they all score very close or higher to 50%. But if you go to Africa, we will see that many of our five top countries for the global health security, they're still scoring zero, like Kenya, Mauritius, or South Africa, which is on fourth. So only Nigeria and Ethiopia, on this five priority, they score up to 24, which is actually very, very low. So if we go to, we will also say that, uh, so from this slide, actually, we can say that all our African countries, they remain very dangerously unprepared to meet future epidemic and pandemic threats. And then in terms of uh, biosecurity, too, we really need to work on that. Taking into consideration that actually the, these different gaps, uh, Africa CDC as the main public health entity for African Union, they have uh, actually agreed with uh, their partners and with the different uh, member states that there is very important to put in place an innovative regional approach to mitigate the gaps identified and uh, in terms of biosafety and biosecurity. So we can see that for biosecurity, uh, for the first joint external evaluation, actually up to 81% of the country, they didn't have clear policies in biosafety. So Africa CDC really make sure that they actually uh, assess, the, it was agreed that uh, just as the risk assessment that we saw for the framework, that it's important that before we implement the frameworks, we need to make an assessment. So Africa CDC has managed to assess the biosecurity and biosafety capacity of the member states, and then to develop a five-year strategic plans that we can use to improve our, our biosecurity. And from there, Africa CDC is working on this project to improve our biosecurity and biosafety system to meet the requirement of the international regulation that I have listed, uh, following five strategic uh, priority, including putting in place a biosecurity legal framework, which will be used for legislation, as it appears that the legislation is actually one of the main challenge. Uh, also putting in place a technical working group for biosafety and biosecurity, in which uh, Dr. Ophili Ujo presented actually the chair for West Africa. Also putting a certification and training program for biosafety and biosecurity. We remember in the presentation of the previous presentation also really emphasize on the challenges of the training and certification. So we want to make sure that on the African continent, we have a training and certification program which can be recognized all over Africa. And then experts from this training should be able to be deployed at any time we, we have some challenges in terms of our security around Africa. So Objectives 4 also is really focused on biosecurity as we need to have in place for institutions we will be handled the pathogens which can pose uh, threats as for in terms of biosecurity or the high risk pathogen. There is need to make sure that they respect some requirements. So this is a regulatory and certification framework. And the Objective 5 is to make sure that our national public health and reference laboratory, they are able to prevent, detect, and quickly respond to events of public health of concerns. So Africa CDC have put a biosecurity and biosecurity framework in place. And the first of this framework is the regional biosafety and biosecurity legal framework, which the countries which are presenting some lack or inadequate legislations, they will then use to develop a legislation which is really multi-sectorial to make sure that we bring on board all the, the I mean, the all the domains uh, which speaks or which have to do with uh, the biosecurity. And since that, we can see that we will be having more and more uh, 
member states of Africa will be domesticating, and we can see already 11 countries domesticating this framework. So it is very important that as this legislation, as the legislation in general, once they are put in place, it is very important that we domesticate it, as we heard from Dr. Babadoy. So Africa CDC has also proposed uh, a scheme to domesticate this legislation as uh, it is put in, in this slide, including legal mapping, including also training of people who will be drafting this legislation. And this uh, framework emphasizes on the fact that we need to have a lead entity which oversee everything, including all the domains in terms of biosecurity, to develop national standards, to have also biological risk assessment, and also this entity should regulate the laboratory or any institution handling the high risk pathogens, which don't then have concerns in terms of biosecurity, train also personnel which have to handle this pathogen and also make sure that the transfer, the storage, and the disposal of agent and toxin of consent, they are really used, uh, they are really made respecting all the requirements in terms of biosecurity. And also from the, the challenges which were clearly emphasized by Dr. Ophili were also identified. The second framework is on the regulatory and certification framework for this institution handling high risk pathogen. And it is made of a minimum standard for biosafety and biosecurity, followed by a score standard assessment checklist and a recognition and certification framework. So all these are used to make sure that the institutions which handle high risk pathogen across Africa, they should respect the requirements and also be authorized before they handle these pathogens. So we can see the first institutions, I mean the first countries already trained and the first institution in Uganda already certified using this framework. This is the UVRI of Uganda. Still in terms of framework, uh, considering the challenges which were raised, including the, the lack of uh, political will, so Africa CDC working with other partners also, including WHO and Robert Koch Institute, they managed to put in place the health security partnership for Africa. And in this uh, health security partnership, there are two framework based uh, for bio security. The first one is the regional framework for bio surveillance of high risk pathogens. So this which should be used to identify the high consequence agent and toxin to have a national list for the country and then followed by a risk assessment that we need to make for each pathogen and develop mitigation measures. And we should not stop there also. Once we have that in place, we should have, we should make a routine bio surveillance for this identified high consequence agent and toxin. And one of the main challenge also is the fact that we remember uh, Dr. Philly also say our biosecurity sometimes is still based on the funding. So we need really need to mobilize the political will to ensure the and enable an environment for surveillance of this bio surveillance. So we need to bring the political will for the bio security. So we want to work on this project also to consolidate the high level political and resource commitment to health security. So that we don't base only on the phone, but our government should be putting funds. And here we have Mali, South Africa, Namibia, Tunisia, Morocco, Morocco, and the Gambia, which has been engaged already. In terms of training, on which uh, Dr. Ophili emphasized, there is uh, a training also considering, I mean, a training program considering what uh, African nations are facing, so including the bio risk management. The bio certificate, uh, the biological safety cabinet, the certification of institution handling high consequence agent and toxin, and also the biological waste and maintenance, the biological waste management. So we want to make sure that we have the subject matter expert, and this subject matter expert, they should consider what uh, from the other people who are already trained to lead them or to mentor them until they reach also the level of the subject matter expert and those who are not yet trained to work with them, to train them and make them grow and become also subject matter expert. So at this point, I just want to say, we can see that the impact of the biosecurity is very on our continent, is uh, very actual, it's, it's we can see that uh, it's very important to, to enhance uh, biosecurity 
in Africa, and this will bring actually a lot of benefit, including the global health security, including safeguarding public health, and promoting economic stability in general, but in particular also, we can also look for the gain that people working in terms of working on the biological agents, they should gain also, I mean, for their own protection also. So at this point, I would just like to, to conclude and say, actually fortifying our biosecurity in Africa is very imperative for mitigating biological threats and safeguarding the well-being of uh, the population across the continent. And by implementing very proactive measures, domesticating the framework at national level and making sure that we have uh, a very good coordination uh, between all the stakeholders and also fostering international collaborations, the region can use this different way to enhance its resilience against biosecurity risks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I want also to thank, as we say, we want to work in terms of uh, collaborations. So I want to thank all those who collaborate with Africa CDC to support the biosecurity, including the Regional Center of Excellence for Biosafety and Biosecurity, including the Technical Working Group, including African Society for Laboratory Medicine, Global Affairs Canada, Biological Trade Reduction Program, Global chemical and biological security through Sandia National Laboratory, the World Bank, the CP, NTI, and all the partners, actually. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jarez, for that very excellent presentation, and congratulations to the great work you and the African CDC is doing in the area of biosecurity and, um, and biosafety. Um, um, I'm a witness to what you guys have been doing in the last few years and your contribution to ensuring reduction of biosecurity threats in different countries in Africa. Congratulations on, on what you're doing. And for the fantastic presentation today, you, you started with with definition of biosecurity and, and biosecurity, and you discussed some of the international conventions the the uh, related to biosecurity, the Biological Weapon Convention, Resolution 1540, and other treaties and international declarations by WHO and other international organizations. And you talked about the, the, the landscape of biosecurity landscape in Africa, the Global Health Security Index, and our African countries are yeah, very low in that the index. Economy about 66% of, of, about 81% of African countries have no policy for biosafety, and I think about 66% have no policy for, for biosecurity. And that shows the, the level we are in Africa, and you, you went on to discuss what, what your organization, the African CDC has been doing in the last few years and the fantastic job you and your team have been doing and the various regulations and frameworks that African CDC has initiated in the last few years, the legal framework, the regulatory and certification framework, regional framework for power surveillance and, and other training and, and certification framework. So that, that, that is very important for us on, on the continent to have a very secure environment. And I'm, I'm a testament to the good work African CDC is doing in the last few years and the collaboration, the collaborations they'll be having with various regional, national, governmental, non-governmental organization. I will continue to look forward to, to increasing such collaborations between organizations and, and African CDC. So without wasting time, we'll go straight to our last, the top presenter, but not the last, the, my good friend, Dr. Jamie Chia, will be speaking to us on policy and regulatory reforms for effective biosecurity in Africa. I'll read about and I'll hand over the floor to her. Dr. Jamie Shia is a disease expert, a security strategist and a senior instructor and a senior instructor 
Jeremy Chia is a 2022 Atlantic Council Millennium Fellow and a senior consultant and infectious disease epidemiologist with nearly 15 years of experience in public health emergency management. She serves as an advisor to senior leaders of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Office of Health Security focused on capacity building with state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. She has successfully managed global multidisciplinary teams of up to 700 people in the daily operations of the Next Generation Global Health Security Network and the National Center for Biomedical Research and Training. She's extremely skilled at coordinating and managing teams across several jurisdictions and countries with competing needs and priorities. Her success in several programs in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic has helped to successfully expand program initiatives both domestically and internationally. Dr. Jerisha, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Great. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. If you can see it, if you could just type a one in the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, thank you to Git for the invitation to come to speak today. Thank you for Dr. Doton for your introduction and to my co-presenters. Um, thank you for not only Dr. Jaris providing just a overall framework, um, definitions, where we are in terms of the landscape on the continent, and then just really leaning into the future of where we anticipate going um, with our five-year strategies and other areas of focus. And I really appreciate Dr. Ophili for leaning into the innovative solutions that are necessary in this space. Um, it's very impactful to think about not only the work that we have done, I guess, since the global health security agenda, but also how we continue to move forward in this space. And having just returned from the global health security conference in Sydney myself, I have been, um, really thoughtful on just how we continue to approach many of these issues. As, as most of you probably know, uh, we've been diligently working on updates to the international health regulations. And so those were recently approved at the World Health Assembly and ideally will come out um, in all translated versions um, in September of this year. And then um, just the increases of work towards the pandemic accords. So. Um, knowing and kind of going through and reviewing the chat that everyone has a little bit of a different experiences with biosecurity. I wanted to kind of start my conversation on policy and regulatory reform for effective biosecurity in Africa from the most basics of understandings. And so really trying to delve into the essential elements and best practices to enhance biosecurity across the continent. So really reinforcing many of the things that you have already heard in the presentation from both a local and global perspective, but also helping us to think about just biosecurity in our day-to-day -day lives and the, the ways that we can work within our communities, but also to sort of reframe our thinking around biosecurity. So to start, I would just encourage you to think about a few questions. How often do you consider the impacts of biosecurity in your daily lives? And then you've had an opportunity now in the webinar to think through regulations and policies, but really think through what roles those regulations and policies actually play in preventing and controlling disease outbreaks in Africa? What have you noticed as strengths? What have you noticed as potential gaps? And so Dr. Jarris was really intentional about talking about the assessments and risk assessments that are necessary. And we know that we really have to take a very holistic whole of community as well as whole of government approach um, to these issues. And now I encourage you to take it just a little bit further in your thinking and imagine the challenges that a country, really any country faces in, let's just say controlling livestock diseases, but you have very limited resources. What steps can be taken to overcome these obstacles? And then how can we as a community contribute to 
enhancing or building stronger biosecurity measures. As I go through the remainder of my presentation, I just encourage you to continue to reflect on these questions um, throughout the discussion, and then let's consider how we can apply the concepts we discuss in our own communities, as well as our professional practices. So I will cover just a very basic biosecurity overview. I know that's been covered pretty well, kind of talk about the landscape and giving some pointed examples. I'm going to talk a little bit about some international standards and compliance, and then I'll talk about just a regional approach and harmonizing regional practices. I'll then go into strengthening regulatory frameworks, capacity building and training, and really hopefully emphasizing some of the um, not only gaps, but also forward leaning approaches that are upcoming. Talk about the role of public campaigns, particularly as we continue to think about how to build or rebuild trust in our communities, and also um, just the role of decreasing misinformation and disinformation. I'll talk a little bit about research and innovation in biosecurity, funding and investments in biosecurity, and then I will close out with just where I see things going in terms of a future direction. So looking at biosecurity overview, um, we know that biosecurity obviously encompasses a large set of preventative measures aimed at reducing the risk of transmission of infectious diseases, pests, as well as invasive species. It's really all about safeguarding our health, our agriculture, and our environment from biological threats. So ideally, we are starting to think about things in more of a One Health perspective, um, moving away from the silos of the individual communities and even expanding that towards a planetary health um, ideology as we think about just the role of all of the other sectors of society. So why is biosecurity so critical or so crucial? From an economic perspective, we know that any biosecurity failures can really lead to devastating loss, unbelievable loss. Take, for example, the outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which can truly decimate the livestock populations and lead to massive economic losses for farmers, as well as an entire nation. When you consider the health perspective, we know that biosecurity helps to prevent zoonotic diseases, those that are transmitted from animals to humans and vice versa. And I think that we have the Ebola as well as the COVID-19 pandemic as solid examples that have underscored the need for robust biosecurity measures. And then from a more environmental perspective, we know that biosecurity is vital for protecting biodiversity, right? So invasive species and pathogens can cause long-term damage to ecosystems leading to not only the loss of native species, but also the, the loss of habitats, which can, which can have long-term implications for communities, for food supplies, um, increasing things such as food insecurity. So what are some of the challenges in Africa? So obviously these have already been stated, but it isn't understated and best reinforced that Africa faces some very unique challenges in biosecurity. The rich biodiversity of the continent increases the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. We know also that porous borders can complicate any efforts to control, whether it be the movement of pests and also the movement of diseases. Additionally, when you have the considerations of limited resources, we know that this often means that biosecurity measures are underfunded, which um, Dr. O'Philly so poignantly noted, and they're poorly implemented. Now, when we move forward and just think a little bit about the current landscape, I wanted to just provide some examples and hopefully this is helpful for people that may be new to the field of biosecurity. Um, we know that just when we look at the landscape, there are tons of things that are happening from biosecurity perspective. It's in, empowering to see um, the five-year strategic plan that really built off the Global Health Security Index conducted by NTI, and now kind of looking at what is the strategic vision across the continent to address the biosecurity concerns. I consistently think that, that as the landscape changes, that we have to continue to have risk assessments that are holistic, um, just to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the rising technology innovations. And so just to give you a few examples, in South Africa, for example, there have been comprehensive regulations um, for both plant and animal health that are supported by very robust surveillance systems. 
as well as rapid response teams. In Kenya, for example, there have been implementations of active surveillance and quarantine measures that have really been pivotal in controlling disease spread, especially when you consider livestock diseases such as Rift Valley fever, for example. And then in Nigeria, despite some resource constraints, there have also been significant strides in disease control, really focusing on community engagement as well as localized surveillance efforts. So what are some of the gaps and limitations? Um, implementation and enforcement of biosecurity measures are really inconsistent across the continent. I think this goes hand in hand with what the speaker said before me. And so even within the country perspectives, there is variation, wide range variation, um, maybe from one part of the country to another. Many countries struggle with inadequate infrastructure, such as laboratory or quarantine facilities, which are really essential for effective biosecurity. Also, we know that there you couple this with issues of funding and knowing that the funding for biosecurity initiatives is often extremely insufficient. And I'm really big on thinking about sustainable funding. So maybe a project is initially funded um, through a certain amount of time, but once the funding expires, then the project ends and what happens to the continued risk of biosecurity. There's also regulatory systems that are fragmented. So it's very encouraging to see some of the legal frameworks um, that were mentioned by previous speakers and just the thoughts of how to streamline the regulatory system across the continent. These are also things that are hindering effective coordination as well as rapid response. <clears throat> Looking at some of the international standards and compliance, we know that international organizations play truly a pivotal role in setting biosecurity standards. So obviously the World Health Organization as an organization provides guidelines and regulations such as the international health regulations, which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that are really set out to prevent and respond to public health risk. We know that the World Organization for Animal Health, previously known as OIE, establishes animal health standards and protocols that are critical for preventing the spread of disease across borders. And then FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization offers guidelines for plant health as well as biosecurity measures. I think there is an important component of alignment. You see so many different things that are happening. Um, you see this at the global level. You see many things happening at the national level and how do those trickle down to the local levels? So I think when you align these international standards, it enhances not only trade opportunities for ensuring that agricultural products meet the global safety standards, but it's also essential for African economies that rely heavily on agriculture. Alignment is also important to reduce the risk of disease outbreak by having a standardized approach across borders, thereby approaching or encouraging international cooperation as well as international support. Now, when we think about things from a regional perspective, I'm starting to see the rise of many regional um, alliances, regional agreements, and also just the overall need for regional assessments, because we oftentimes know that if something happens in one particular part of the world, it's generally MOUs with neighboring countries that are, have been impactful in helping with controlling measures. So harmonizing biosecurity policies across African nations is truly essential. Um, it not only facilitates streamlined trade and movement across borders, but it also ensures that biosecurity measures are consistent from one place to another and effective. So we know that the coordinated approach assists in responding to diseases. And so you can kind of think about it from the perspective of the rapid response teams that Dr. Joris mentioned. Um, really helping to respond to disease outbreaks effectively, as well as reducing any duplication of efforts and resources. So if you already have resource constraints, how can you work together, maybe potentially in a regional perspective to build a stronger, sustainable capacity? 
In terms of collaborations, I just have these two examples I want to provide, which are more so of a regional approach. So there's the example of the East African Community, uh, which is a regional intergovernmental organization of eight partner states. And they have developed an animal health strategy focusing on harmonized disease control measures across member states. So this strategy has really been instrumental in controlling transboundary animal diseases, such as foot and mouth disease. Similarly, the Southern African Development Community, which is an organization that's committed to everything from development to peace and security, to economic growth, as well as alleviating poverty, um, has implemented a plant protection strategy that promotes regional cooperation in plant health, focusing on pest surveillance, as an example, focusing on management and control, all working together to really enhance coordination enhance preparedness and harmonize control interventions. So when I see such strong policies already happening within the continent, I'm always encouraged to say there's really no need to reinvent the wheel per se. So to create something from scratch, how can we leverage the, the positive things that are happening to really just continue to increase our biosecurity capabilities? Now looking at strengthening regulatory frameworks, so hopefully this is also reinforcing from some of the information already covered, but I think that just some of the critical elements would in be inclusive of strengthening regulatory frameworks for effective biosecurity. So we want to think about how can we build out more robust surveillance systems for early detection of diseases, right? So you wanna be able to detect as early as possible to mitigate the risk to the community. Quarantine measures to prevent the spread of disease. So really trying to implement those and that goes hand in hand with having strong surveillance systems. And then lastly, building out those rapid response teams to be able to quickly respond, control and maintain any outbreaks that may be happening. From a legal framework perspective, we know that robust legal frameworks are essential to support enforcement and compliance. And legal preparedness has been something that has been ongoing, particularly in the global health security agenda, coupled with many of the international health regulations are things that are happening across international standards. So I know it's at the forefront of the international community's mind, and it's nice to see just some of the legal frameworks that are coming out of the Africa CDC as well. Um, laws and regulations should obviously be clearly outlined and they should be clear guidelines for biosecurity practices, as well as the penalties for any violations. I think the legal backing in general ensures that biosecurity measures are taken seriously and they are consistently applied. So when you have a framework, you know that within a particular country, region, et cetera, that you're going to have a consistency across the board. <clears throat> capacity building and training. Um, building capacity for biosecurity involves continuous training and obviously skills developments for professionals such as veterinarians, such as plant health inspectors, as well as customs officials, if we're thinking about it from a more holistic perspective. I am also very, very much leaning into a concept, um, and I think Dr. Douglas is on the line, so I do want to give him credit, but we were recently together at the um, Global Health Security Conference. And one of the things that he is championing is this one life security concept, which really thinks about a whole of community approach to the topic and just the reforms that we need to make, which takes into account things like risk communication that really builds trust with the communities, but also thinking about some of the political risk that we may have and that we're consistently seeing worldwide. And so I like to think about capacity building and training, not only from the perspective of training skilled workers, but also trainings for the community. I think it's not only a way to build trust, but it is also a way to make sure that you have an informed population. So if you think back to the very beginning, the questions that I ask, how does biosecurity impact your day-to-day -day life? We know about the we know about the impacts that we have in medical settings. We know about the impacts that we have in laboratories, but how often do we think about just the day-to-day -day farming and agricultural risk, the day-to-day -day risk that we have within our community? I think any types of additional regular updates on new technology or new methods are really also crucial to keep biosafety measures effective. 
Um, I just provided here a couple of effective examples. Um, the FAO um, Emergency Center for Transboundary Animal Diseases has a phenomenal training program. And I was a part of one of their workshops uh, last week. And it's really focused on enhancing regional biosecurity capacities and capabilities. And it looks at it from a whole of community perspective. So you have government officials working right alongside community leaders or community partners and really prioritizing the important initiatives, but also moving forward with establishing biosecurity capabilities. Similarly, the World Health Organization does have a workforce development program and they, they tailor the needs to the local community, which really ensures that biosecurity measure, measures are contextually relevant and also effective. And this program not only focuses on disease surveillance and outbreak response, but it does focus on uh, risk communication as well. Going a little bit deeper in some of the other, I think, policy and areas that are super important is on the role of public campaigns. And it can't be understated just the role of working with the community, but any type of public awareness campaigns are really critical for promoting biosecurity practices at the most basic level, what we call the grassroots level. Um, effective strategies include not only using the media and the community events to educate the public about the importance of biosecurity, but also how can they contribute to preventing disease outbreaks. So it's really an effort to increase understanding, to build trust, but to also start early in combating misinformation and disinformation. So there's opportunities to use radio programs, TV shows, but then also largely social media, which has really been a driver for not only information sharing, but also misinformation and disinformation. Um, community initiatives are very important and can be um, super advantageous for policy implementation and policy reform. So this can be inclusive of everything such as community-led surveillance programs that can empower local communities to monitor and report diseases. Um, there have been several instances of community-based animal health workers in African countries that have been successful in not only their training, but also monitoring and reporting livestock health, reporting diseases, and implementing uh, necessary biosecurity measures as they come out from government levels. Educational workshops are extremely powerful because they can train local leaders as well as community members in biosecurity and so starting once again at the most basic level. So just to give you an example, there is the Participatory Epidemiological Network for Animal and Public Health, and they conduct workshops to build community capacity for disease surveillance and response. So these initiatives not only enhance local biosecurity, but they also foster a sense of ownership and responsibility among community members, which is really, really important to encourage compliance with biosecurity measures. Research and innovation in biosecurity. So research is critically fundamental to biosecurity. It continues to lead to the development of new diagnostic tools, new vaccines, new treatment methods, for example, which are critical for managing and controlling diseases. Um, when we think about the role of institutions, I want to just take a little bit step of a step further because I think we always have this conversation somewhat in a bubble where we think about only the government entities, maybe only NGOs, or civil society and the local community, but what about the role of uh, research institutions and universities? So I think African research institutions and universities continue to play a very vital role in not only enhancing biosecurity by creating evidence-based practices, but also continuing to invest in and train the next generation. So there have been institutions like Kenya's Medical Research Institute, and the Nagoshi Memorial Institute for Medical Research in Ghana that have been conducting very cutting edge research on infectious diseases that continue to impact biosecurity. Um, there are also collaborations with international research bodies such as the International Livestock Research Institute that can help to leverage resources and expertise and ensure innovations are both cross-cutting 
but also applicable to the local context. So it's not just taking something that may be applicable in Europe, but it's taking something that is applicable and making it applicable in the African context. Um, these collaborations continue to foster knowledge exchange and capacity building. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't just also talk about the importance of organizations like GIT that are really leaning forward in the knowledge sharing capacity, the knowledge exchange, in convening and being a convening body to bring people together to share lessons learned and best practices, but also continuing to provide African solutions for African problems. Looking at funding and investment, so I think that any effective biosecurity requires substantial investments. And so we're starting to see the rise of many different funding bodies. And I think there's a lot of just political natures behind some things, but there's also really, really great work that's being done that it's being translational um, to many parts of society. So I think that government governments in general need to allocate budgets specifically for biosecurity initiatives. As you're seeing things like the joint external evaluations, which are leading to national action plans for health security, we are seeing larger commitments to um, biosecurity funding, sustainable biosecurity funding. And I think this will go hand in hand with the Africa CDC five-year plan on biosecurity. Also, your international aids from organizations like the World Bank or USAID play a crucial role in really starting to supplement these areas or continue to supplement these areas. There are private public partnerships that can also foster significant investments in biosecurity. So for example, the African Development Bank has funded several biosecurity projects aimed at improving um, disease surveillance and response infrastructure. I think as we continue to think about funding in this space, particularly sustainable funding, that we have to think about it from a One Health approach that really integrates all parts of society, human, animal, and environmental. And I think these projects that are funded under the One Health framework oftentimes will receive the support from multiple sources, but also continue to think about the sustainability and accountability. So once we start to lean into thinking about the sustainability of projects or programs, particularly as they relate to biosecurity, the funding is critical, but the sustainability is extremely important. This involves not only how do you secure the initial investment, but also how do you continue to maintain long-term financial support for biosecurity programs? So transparency and of course, accountability and the use of the funds are gonna be essential to build trust, but to also ensure that you have those effective biosecurity metrics. And then my last slide, I just wanna kind of focus in on the future directions and conclusions as we think through some of the policy challenges and, and where we may need to see reform the most. So. We know that there are tons of emerging trends, biotechnology being one, looking ahead, we can envision that several emerging trends will shape the future of biosecurity in Africa. Of course, advances in biotechnology, such as gene editing, such as synthetic biology offer new tools for disease control and prevention. But I think as Dr. Philly mentioned, we also have to think about the dual use of research of concern. And so how things could potentially be nefariously used. Um, there are digital technologies that are rising. So we see the rise of mobile health applications, as well as data and analytics that are enhancing disease surveillance and response capabilities, which are very much welcome. Um, these tools allow for more efficient as well as effective monitoring and management of disease outbreaks. So from a policy recommendation standpoint, I would say to move forward, we need comprehensive policy recommendations that address current gaps as well as anticipate future challenges. I think in addressing the current gaps that we have to take that from approach of risk assessments, which are really holistic and inclusive of the community. I think that's the, really the only way to establish a baseline so that we truly know what resiliency is, but also how can we lean into understanding future challenges um, 
I additionally think that we have to collectively adopt a one health approach. This means integrating, like I said previously, the human, animal, and environmental health policies to create a truly holistic and coordinated biosecurity strategy. And I just want to leave with a call to action. So I think that effective biosecurity in Africa really does require a concerted effort from all stakeholders. Okay, so not just governments, not just parts of society, really whole of society, whole of community approach. Um, so as we kind of move forward in our conversations, I encourage each of you to think not only how you can contribute to enhancing biosecurity in your respective fields, but what can we do from a level of policy advocacy as we're thinking about the gaps, as we're thinking about leaning into the future, but then also what should we be thinking about from a research perspective, and then how can we continue to engage the community. Thank you so much for your time and your participation in the webinar, and I'm welcoming all questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamisha, Dr. for that very detailed and educating, educating presentation. I, I've learned so much, and I'm just going through what I wrote down. I hope I won't do a, a repetition of your presentation. But two things I, I, I gained from, from what you said. Number one, about security is everybody's business. It's, it's not just... It's not just for scientists or researchers or those that works that work in the laboratory, but everybody in your day-to-day -day life and in your discipline, biosecurity is, is very important. How does it impact your day-to-day -day life? And how can we all work together to reduce biosecurity threats on the continent of Africa? That's that is very important. And number two, the, the concept of one health, integrating human health, animal health, and environmental health is very important to understanding clearly that man cannot live in isolation of his environment. And man is only as healthy as the environment he lives in, the food he eats, the water he drinks, and the sanity of the environment he lives in. So ensuring biosecurity means making sure that your environment is safe, whether in the laboratory, whether in your home, whether where you work. Biosecurity is, is everybody's business. So it went through a whole lot, a whole lot of discussion from biosecurity overview to current biosecurity landscape in Africa, existing frameworks in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, some gaps and limitations. And we've, we've all, been, all been discussing almost the uh, uh, same gaps and limitation, insufficient funding, insufficient, inconsistent implementation of policies, both at the regional, not just implementation, domestication and implementation of policies, domestication of international policies, and effective implementation of policies as, at all levels is very important. You talk about international standards and compliance standards from WHO, from FAO, and, and from WAH, and the importance of, of alliance, different, different organizations, both at the international, national, regional level, breaking silos and working together, health experts, working with, with environmental experts and animal experts. To ensure that we have a, a, a planetary, we have a planetary health ideology, making sure that the health sector, the environmental sector, and the human sector is safe and preventing outbreaks using an holistic approach. Talked about the global health security agenda, which you, which you, I'm sure, yeah, you said you you in. In Australia too, with Dr. Philly, welcome back to this part of the world. Uh, uh, the jet lag was not that that bad. So the global security agenda, you know, and and activities that goes with it, the challenges to effective laboratory bio risk management, coordination challenges, lack of laboratory bio safety and bio security awareness, lack of adequate implementation of policies in our lab laboratories. And you provide some solutions to capacity building and training. We cannot emphasize that. 
community engagement and uh, risk management. And in conclusion, you talked about efforts, all stakeholders should be involved. It's not somebody's business, but security is transdisciplinary, is multidisciplinary. We have to break our silos and make sure that we integrate various sources of knowledge, both conventional and non-conventional sources of knowledge to address biosecurity threats on, on the continent. So thank you very much, Doc, for that very detailed presentation. And Kate is very happy that we have the platform or the opportunity to bring together this extremely intelligent experts in the subject matter we're discussing today. It's not easy to, to have this kind of experience, very different, wonderful experts in the, in the, in the subject matter on, on the same platform. And we we'll thank you very much for, for giving Kate the opportunity to, to, to put together this webinar and for attending, agreeing to speak at this webinar. We we'll sincerely appreciate your time, your experience and, and your expertise that you've been sharing the last few minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Philly, Dr. Jemisha, my very good friend, Dr. Joris. Before we head, uh, I have to say a big thank you to our participants too. Like I used to say, you are the reason why we organize this every month. For those I would like to know in the last one and the other, we've had almost, almost 200 participants from almost 30 different countries. So it's when we see such, such statistics, we're always very happy and glad to organize the next one. Before we go today, I will give opportunity to one participant to, to make a comment or maybe ask a question directly. If you're interested, any of our participants, attendees are interested in asking a question, you can just raise up your hand and we'll give you two minutes to contribute while I look at the question and answer section. And I, I think some, if not most of the questions have been answered, but I think we have some for few questions for Dr. Jamie Sher. Yes, I can just, I can read one or two questions, then you respond. The first one, how does political interference influence the biosecurity policies across the world? How can these governing bodies control this interference? Uh, thank you for the question. So I think it's a very large question. Um, I think we're seeing it from many perspectives, right? I think that the role of political leaders in understanding some of the health threats may be limited. And with that being said, their commitment to actually investing in biosecurity and biosafety and, and all things global health security um, can be waning over time. So it has to actually be seen as a priority to have the investments, particularly the sustainable investments. But I think that you're also seeing a global just rise with the rise of misinformation and disinformation, some of the concerns about laboratory capacities and some of the concerns about infrastructure and building infrastructure capacity within countries and just the political credence that comes alongside that and, and what that means for actually being able to build capacities locally and have sustained um, investments in biosecurity capacity. So it's really twofold, internal influences and external influences. Um, to answer the second half of the question, which is um, how can governing bodies can control these interferences? I think a lot of that has to do with doing the work of educating the, the political leaders. Just as much as we are committed to educating the people in the local communities, we also have to be committed to educating our community or our politicians so that they are well aware of the realities of biosecurity and the continued investments that need to be made. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for that response. I go to the second. We'll take one more question. Before I take this question, I, I have to state clearly that Dr. Jamie Shea is not representing the U.S. government on this platform. And, and what she's speaking is, is her own personal contribution. So the question goes thus. What is the U.S. doing to help Africa and most importantly Nigeria and Niger where Boko Haram is active on implementing policies and ensuring these policies are implemented to the grassroots level 
to prevent weaponization of these bioagents using rudimentary methods. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, Dr. Ophelia may have some comments on this one as well. So I will invite you to come in. Um, I am not representing the U.S. government, so I want to be very clear on that. And so Dr. Dotan, thank you for throwing that out there. Um, but I will just say that obviously there are commitments from not only U.S. agency, but also multilateral agencies that are committed to reducing the threat of um, bioweapons. And so I think Dr. Jarris really highlighted many of these just institutional frameworks and treaties that we have in place and really leaning into those. I think it's a rising issue globally that we continue to try to combat, but I know that there are things that are happening not only from the, the U.S. perspective in terms of investments in Nigeria and Nigeria, but also trying to strengthen the local uh, capacity as well. Dr. Philly, I just want to see what comments that you would like to add. Thank you. I think you answered correctly. There are also a lot of initiatives within the continent from the African CDC point of view through the African CDC Biosafety Biosecurity Initiative, where countries are brought together in terms of training, experts are invited, and the tra uh, trainers are trained, and they go back to their country level to actually step down some of this training. Uh, so a lot of awareness creation is happening within the continent to ensure that uh, we have a secure society. Also within the West African sub-region, we have the West African Health Organization that is doing a lot in terms of uh, training and certification as well, especially for institutions handling high-risk pathogens. So in terms of mitigation, in terms of ensuring that we have um, a region that is safe and secure, so a lot of advocacy is happening at the technical level, even at the at the governmental level, African heads of states and uh, governments are also invited once in a while Espas are also invited to brief them on the state of play within the continent. So a lot is happening because we know that um, any problem within a particular country is not only that country that is affected, but the whole of the region. So it's a collective responsibility. Um, in, in Nigeria um, has a lot of countries um, that are surrendering Nigeria that have a lot of issues. So when we are discussing issues of Boko Haram, issues of Al-Shabaab and the rest of them, so it's a collective responsibility and heads of government see it that way. So thank you. Oh, fa fantastic, Dr. Ophelia and Dr. Jemisha. And, and I can add to that that in, in the area of our security, that there are a lot of integrated activities that are going on in Nigeria. I know from the Office of the National Security Advisor to to the military and, and other biosecurity agency, even, even at the presidency, making sure that the, the, the non-state actors we have in Nigeria does not have access to biological agents that can be used as, as weapon of war. So I, I know at, at the national regional level, there are a lot of collaborations between scientists and, and the military and, and the security to, to ensure we have biosecurity and, and we don't experience power terror terrorism in, in this part of the world. So oh, we're getting, I think, is there an attendee that is raising up his hand? No, there's none. So we're oh, getting close to the end of, of the webinar today. Before we go, let me use this platform to invite everybody again to the get conference of one health and biosecurity get organized it's a conference of biosecurity every year and we've done it in or we've had the conference in different countries in sub-saharan africa in the last 10 years it has been held in, in sierra leone in Ghana, in seneca and this year's event will be coming up in lagos later in the year from the 6th to 8th of november 2024 it's our 10th ed edition and i'm using this platform to invite everybody to that conference. Our conference has grown over the years to become one of the biggest biosecurity based platform on, on the continent of Africa. And it's a very good platform for us to, to get to know each other and, and, and to understand the latest issues in the area of biosecurity on the continent. So I use this platform. I use this platform to to 
welcome everybody to that to that conference. Go to our website www.getafrica.org if you want if you want to to register for a conference and attend a conference later in November. Before we go, I think let me let me take one more minute of last last words from my presenter, starting from Dr. Jerez. Anything to say? Last one minute. Hi, Dr. Jarris, are you there? Any last word for our participants? You're muted. Uh, Dr. Jarris, I guess you don't know you're muted. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you now. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Papadeo. Thank you to you and your team from the Get Consortium. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Jamesha Hoyle, for the very great presentations, very informative. And to Dr. Donaro Fili, our chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. I want to thank also all the participants online and say I will, I, I have shared my my uh, email. Apologies if I miss some of the question. I have tried to text it to send all the answers of the question because I knew I was going to have some challenges. So I went off. My connection went off, so I try and catch up quickly. I'm glad that I managed to join you guys before you close the meeting. Thank you very much, and we remain connected all together. Thank you. Fantastic. Dr. Philly. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Babadoye. Thank you, Gates uh, Consortium, for the invitation. Also, thank you, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jamikia Hall, for the great presentation, Dr. Jarez. Thank you so much, even participants, for, for being here. There are a lot of questions. I will try to answer some of them. A lot also want to know um the where they can assess um, training we, the, you can assess training through IFBA IFBA's International Federation of Biosafety Associations go to their website and you will see their training programs even African CDC also have a lot of training programs West African Health Organization WAHU also have a lot of training programs even at the national level Association of Biosafety As that is by safety associations also offer a lot of training at national level, even Sandia laboratories. So take advantage of uh, some of these training programs to get certified as a by safety by security practitioner. Once again, thank you, Get Consortium, for this invitation. Thank you all. Bye. Uh, thank you, Dr. Filia. Finally, Dr. Jamisha. Uh, yeah, once again, thank you to the GET Consortium for inviting me here today. Thank you for Dr. Dotan for organizing and the introductions to my co-presenters, Dr. Philly, Dr. Jars. Thank you for your informative presentations, just really giving us uh, tons to think about. And thank you for the participants for staying online with us today and your very thoughtful questions and your thoughtful engagements. And I hope beyond this that you will take the recommendations, not only for the trainings, but what you can do in your local communities to make an impact. Um, I provided my LinkedIn information in the chat. So please feel free to connect with me there. Reach out if you do have any questions, if I can be any help in the future, um, I'm always available. And hopefully I look forward to seeing you all in November in Nigeria for the GIT conference. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jamisha. And Finally, I want to say a big thank you to our participants. Like I always say, you are the reason why we organize this every month. And as usual, we are going to share our certificate of participation immediately after this, after this, after the webinar. And hopefully, we are also going to share the, the presentations of our of our speakers. That's if they give us the, the go ahead to do that. So on behalf of Global Global Emerging Pathogens Consortium Get. I want to thank everybody, our speakers and participants, for 
attending this webinar again. We'll see you same time next month by God's grace. Have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.